Lord Jesus, we live in interesting times. Heavenly Father, we live in a time when people are actively determined not to serve you. We live in a world where people don't want to know the truth, where people don't want to see the light, and where people don't want to walk the straight and narrow path that leads to heaven. Lord Jesus, as believers, we are often discouraged by what we see around us, where even people who once proclaimed themselves to be followers of you no longer follow you. They have heaped to themselves teachers to tickle their ears. Lord God, in these times, help us to remember that you are still God in heaven. Help us to remember that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And yes, Lord God, we know you are returning soon. But also, Lord God, we know that your Holy Spirit is with us each and every day, guiding us, guarding our hearts, sealing us for that day when we will see Jesus face to face. So, Lord Jesus, as we look into your word, as Father God, as we plumb the depths of the knowledge that you have revealed to us, May we do so with the certainty and the knowledge and the assurity that you are still King of kings and Lord of lords. You are still God upon the throne. Lord, I pray that as we look into your word, you'll open it up to our hearts and to our minds. And I ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Psalm 23 The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5 and 13 to 17. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, 
disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. While evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned, and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. Fear Christian, you should not be surprised that Jesus got it exactly right when he told his followers that if the world hated him, it would certainly hate them. Did you catch that? If the world hated him, it would certainly hate them. And by them, if you're a Christian, that means us. The world hates Jesus. And we can look at the world around us and we can see that hatred in action. If you, you do this, just simple statistics on Christianity and the persecution of the Christian church over the past 2,000 years, Christians have undeniably been the most hated and persecuted group of any group down through history. And the group that comes in second are the Jews, which I find very interesting that Christians and Jews hold the gold medal and the silver medal of persecuted peoples. Around the world today, Christians are the most persecuted people in the world. And in the United States, the Jews are the most persecuted people. Here in North America, no other group lives under such a relentless microscope looking for flaws than the Christian church. A, a liberal, a leftist, can commit sins far worse than any a Christian might commit, but it's the Christian who's going to make the news, not the leftist. You know, one example I read some years ago is somebody was saying about how evil the Catholic church is because of all the things the priests have done to children in the Catholic Church, and someone went and took all the statistics of child abuse by staff members at public schools in the United States, compared it to the child abuse that takes place in the Catholic Church, and came to the conclusion that a child going to a public school is more likely to be abused or sexually abused by a school teacher than a child going to a Catholic church. But it's not the schools that are coming un under the, the vicious attacks. It's the Christian church. And if it happens in one church, all churches get blamed. There is there's an evil attitude towards Christianity. There is a hatred and a mocking towards Christianity. One atheist said, you can't debate with Christians. And the reason he said that in his own mind was the idea is that Christians are irrational, but that's that's not the truth of it. He had debated Christians and and had been absolutely trounced in the la in a couple of his debates by Christians who were far more rational and far more logical than he was. And so he said a number of years ago, you can't debate with Christians. Your only recourse is to mock them, to ridicule them. This was not the response of a rational person of science. This is a response of a hater of God. This is the world we live in. Because the world hated Jesus, it is most certainly going to hate his followers. So what's the solution? 
Well, the world has a solution for us. They want us to give up Jesus. We can keep the name Jesus, but we have to invent a new God and new doctrines to go with that name. And I was watching a video just this little while ago, and the lady on it was saying, when you talk to one of these new kinds of Christians, people who have given up the Jesus of Scripture for the Jesus of their imagination, and they use many of the same basic terms of Christianity, you have to ask how they define their terms, because they might use the same terms and give to them different meanings. When you talk to these, these Christians who have compromised with the world, it is the same as if you are talking to a cult group. Well, that's the solution the world asks of us. Give up the Jesus of the Bible. Why? Why do they want us to give up the Jesus of the Bible? Why does the world want us to give up the Jesus of the Bible? Why are they pushing us to give up the truth? Why are they pushing us to live in this communal lie that they have created in North America? I think there's a couple of reasons there. The first is that they want the church to give up the mandate that Jesus has given to it, to go into all the world and make disciples. They don't like that. They don't like Christians preaching the gospel. They don't like being reminded that they are living in sin. They don't like the reality of the Christian life uh, standing in, in contrast to their sinful ways because they want to live in the darkness. And people who want to live in the darkness don't want the light of the truth shining in their eyes. They love their darkness. So please, Christians, stop preaching the gospel. Stop trying to make disciples of all men. If you give up obeying Jesus, if you give up following the God of the Bible, we'll be good with you. Make yourself a new Jesus. There's another reason. The people who are offended by Christians, the people who are offended by the very existence of Jesus Christ, want us to give up Jesus. They want us to surrender our relationship with God Almighty. They want us to join them in their lifestyle, to be one of them. They want us to give up the light and join them in the darkness. So the first goal is to get us to stop preaching Jesus. And the second goal is to get us to stop loving Jesus and knowing Jesus. The goal of the world that hates Jesus is to eradicate his name, to eradicate his life, to eradicate his ministry, to eradicate his deity from this world because the presence of Jesus is a reminder of sin. You think of, of the tax collector, Zacchaeus. Jesus went to his home for a meal. And as he's sitting there with Zacchaeus eating, Zacchaeus is overcome with the guilt of his own sin and finally declares to Jesus, if I have done any wrong, I will fix it. If I, as a tax collector, have overcharged the people, I will repay them five times what they paid me. He's so racked with the guilt of his life. When a person comes face to face with the real Jesus, they will react in one of two, two ways. They will fall on their knees and worship him. Or they will bare their teeth and curse him. In, in scripture, it says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Some people will do it willingly. But on the end of time, at the end of time when Christ returns, there will be many who do it in anger. There will be many who will do it with hatred. The Christian has bowed the head. The Christian has fallen upon their knees before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And the world is asking us to reject him. So what, what do we do? Especially in this this time we're living in where Christianity in North America is reviled more and more and more, and politicians are no longer even hiding their disdain for the Christian church. 
already in 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 some places like California persecution of the church is beginning how do we respond if we've already compromised our faith it's easy enough to see a person going a little further and a little further and a little further as the, as the world asks us to give up more and more and more and more. We'll let you be if you give up this part of Jesus. We'll let you be if, if you give up that part of Jesus. Just worship a, a, a neutered Jesus. Just worship a, a, a Jesus who says warm, fluffy, hippie kind of things. Don't, don't don't you dare worship the Jesus who cleansed the temple. Don't you dare worship the Jesus who healed the sick, raised the dead, and forgave sins. Oh, we don't want that Jesus. Or you can draw near to him. You can hang on to Jesus all the tighter. The choice is to compromise with the world. Or to conform to Jesus Christ. To be transformed by the gospel of Jesus. And how do we do that? Oh, you know how to do it. Read your Bible. Get to know the Jesus of Scripture with your mind. And take those words of Jesus and put them in your heart. You know, like the psalmist, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We need to take the word of God the written word of God, and commit it to our minds, to our hearts, so that we will look and gaze upon the spoken word of God, the living word of God, Jesus Christ our Lord, with a clearer vision. Read your Bible. You want to protect your faith in Christ. Read the scriptures. If you want to prevent huge false doctrines from coming into your life, read your Bible. I've seen many churches where the Bible became less and less important, less and less believed. I was at a funeral with a dear friend of mine probably 14 years ago. And the minister doing the, the, uh, the homily for the funeral, she read a passage of scripture out of the Gospel of John. And here's how she introduced it. Introduced it. She said, I'm reading to you the Gospel ascribed to John. And that little phrase told me all I needed to know. She did not believe John wrote the Gospel. She did not believe the Bible is God's word. And she did not believe what she was reading. She had compromised her faith in Christ to such a degree she was no longer a Christian. But we are to read the Word of God and to put it into our hearts, to put it into our minds, to trust it, for it is the words of salvation. Where else can we go for the truth than to Jesus? Where else can we find him than in the Scripture? The next thing we need to do is work on our relationship with God. Have you been coasting along? Not really building your relationship with Jesus? In the easy times, have you slipped the car of your spiritual life into neutral and you're just coasting down that hill? Well, guess what? That hill you've been coasting down has bottomed out and is starting to go up. And if you don't slip your faith back into gear, you're not going anywhere. You need to work on your relationship with Jesus. You need to work on it in prayer in thanksgiving, in how you live your life, you need to be focused on Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. He rose from the dead. He's, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding on your behalf. He's given to us another paraclete who will guide us and lead us and teach us. But we need to be working on that relationship with Jesus and not just coasting along thinking that a little bit of faith is all we need. A little bit of a relationship is all we need. We just need to know one or two scriptures. We just need to have little tiny prayers over our meals. And, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. That's enough of praying. No. There's nothing in that that's going to build your relationship. You need to work on your relationship with Jesus through your prayers. How often are we to build our relationship with Jesus. How often are we to read our scriptures? It's a good thing to do every Sunday, absolutely. 
and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We don't get a day off from being Christian. God didn't give us the Sabbath, Saturday, so we could take a day off from worshiping him. He gave us that Sabbath in the Old Testament to worship him or to come back on Saturdays to worship him. And now in the New Testament, he didn't give it to us one day. He gave to us seven days a week where we are to focus our hearts and minds on Christ Jesus. There's a third thing we need to do. We need to guard one another. We need to, to be the protectors of each other in the faith. I have seen it a lot lately. Christians on the inter internet declaring why I no longer go to church, why I no longer fellowship with other Christians, why I'm going it alone. And that is an absolute recipe for disaster. We are meant to be in fellowship with each other. Those who choose to go it alone, oh, well, I got hurt at church, so I'm done with church. That's a very petty answer. You think you're the only one who's been hurt at church? We've all been hurt at church. Why? Because there's not a perfect person at church, not even the pastor. If you think, well, the pastor hurt me, therefore I can never go to church again. Well, that's foolish. The pastor doesn't give you eternal life. The pastor can't take your salvation away from you. It's Jesus. And if you are isolating yourself from your fellow believers in Christ, you're actually also beginning to isolate yourself from Jesus. If we think we can make it alone, it's a recipe for disaster. The Christian who purposely isolates himself from the rest of the church is beginning the process of, of isolating themselves from Jesus. We need to be in his word. We need to be in prayer. We need to be in fellowship to, to support each other, especially in the hard times. We were never meant to be alone. That's why when you look in Genesis and, and God saw Adam there, it said it was not good for man to be alone. It still isn't. And it's not just talking about marriage. It's, it's talking about being in relationship with, with each other because the very nature of God is relational. And in the church, we are called to be in a relationship with each other and with God. So if we are going to protect our faith, we're going to stand firm in our faith. We need to read our Bibles. We need to pray and grow in our relationship with God. And we need to remain in fellowship even when it's painful even when it hurts. It's a challenge. The world is asking us to give up Jesus. Jesus is asking us to give up the world. The world is asking us to give up truth. Jesus is asking us to give up lies. The world is asking us to give up love. The world, Jesus is asking us to give up hate. What are you going to choose? Do you want a relationship with with hatred with lies and eternal damnation or do you want a relationship with the prince of peace do you want a relationship with the savior of your soul do you want a relationship with the god who loves you and gave himself as a sacrifice and a ransom for many which god do you want the world or the creator of the world it's a challenge but I pray that you answer the challenge by saying, just like Joshua, I will serve God. I will return to Jesus. And if you have been slipping away, growing cold, coasting in your faith, I challenge you, return to Jesus with an intensity and a fullness and a determination that you will accept nothing else other than the real Christ. I pray you will accept this challenge. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we read in God's holy word that the greatest command upon the church and upon every believer to, is to love the Father, to love you with the very core of our being. With all that we are, we are called to love God. And Jesus, we are called to keep our eyes upon you. Help us to be a people who are not led astray by the the difficulties of this life. 
Help us not to get mired down in the, into the minutia. Help us not to, to stand in judgment over one another. Help us not to, to be led away into paths of unrighteousness. Help us to keep our feet on the straight and narrow. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Our hearts focused on God. And our goal always ever to be to spend eternity with you, Lord Jesus. Jesus, so often many of us will get distracted by the things of this world. Help us to take our eyes off of those things. Help us to turn to you. Help us to be the children we were called to be. Forgive us for those times we've wandered away from you. Jesus, we ask this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <music>